Hi, I'm Elisa. I'm with the Amsterdam Internet Exchange, and I'm 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 a little I'm not feeling very well, so I may yeah. partly not make a lot of sense. If so, please ask and interrupt me because um, it's it's a difficult morning. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't think <laughs> I don't think Amzix has been here before at this meeting. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a couple of basic facts on what do we actually do, where are we, what are we, what are we doing out there in Amsterdam. Um, I think the general, general concept of an internet exchange is something we all know here, right? So, um, so AMSIX, obviously, it says in the name so, is based in and around Amsterdam, and we're not really extending outside of that area, at least not our own network. Um, we're a non-profit organization, and we're, we're, we're present in seven co-locations around um, that town. We're using brocade hardware, so I'm not very interested in all those brochures out there because I kind of have seen all of them already. Um, and yeah, the facts and the numbers, we have 350 members connecting to 613 ports <coughs> and we are almost doing a terabit of traffic. <clears throat> I can say that already, right? If it's 944, you can say that it's almost a terabit. <laughs> um, this is the co-locations we're at. Uh, the first four were like the first ones when AMSIX um, started out well over 10 years ago. And, and then as of 2006, seven, we started adding basically uh, one co-location a year, um, which keeps happening. So we are present in, in more and more locations there. The reason being that, um, yeah, being a non-profit, we're trying to be neutral and not bound to a specific provider. So we're extending to, to various locations so people can basically connect there everywhere. Um, we're going to pop Telecity 4 um, not in the usual way as we as we usually put all our hardware there locally, but we're going to do that um, kind of daisy chained to Telecity 2 um, with no with no active hardware on the other side. Um, the summer and then and then and then we're talking to TerraMark, who's building a data center in Amsterdam right now. And if they're actually gonna comply with with the data center center standard that we have, we actually we last year, uh, two years ago in 2008, we had a couple of um, incidents with uh, the few of our oldest co-locations. Um, after which we decided that it may be a good idea to actually have a minimal requirement standard that um, the data centers we go into have to comply with before we actually do so. So in 2009 we had a company based on various, I'm, I won't get it together out of the top of my head, based on various ISO standards and looking at the situation, um, develop <coughs> a data set of standard for us, which is now which is now online on our website too. And, um, and this year we are actually auditing all the locations we are at against the standard. And it's all it's all on the website if they comply or not comply, but we're definitely not going to go into anything new anymore, which is not. Um, that's just for you can read that later. Uh, we have something we have we have a this is just I, I have to mention that too. Um, we have a reseller port program now, um, which is basically it allows you to um, yeah. Say um, I, I I can I, I I sell you Amzix here kind of thing, so you can buy a you can you can buy out a line you can buy out a auto port going to Amsterdam and you can extend that to over here and basically as your own service sort of get customers and tell them okay you can connect to Amzix here in my data center that might be interesting to I don't know data center providers smaller IXPs or maybe. I mean, maybe even ISPs, I don't know. Um, if this sounds like a good idea to you, then uh, let me know after this talk. Um, okay, back to the traffic. So this is our traffic graph. There's not really much to say. Those updates are always really boring because you just, oh, more traffic, more members, more something. But I haven't been here before, so at least I can show it once, right? Um, all right, and now, now what I actually want to talk about, so this was all the the basic defaults that we had to add. <coughs> what I actually want to talk about is our topology migration that we did last year, which was kind of interesting because we, we moved from, from a basic layer two topology to an MPLS network now at Amzix. And I'll go a little bit over what the reasons, what the reasons were for that and how our topology looked like before. So before it was this thing, um, that thing is uh, uh, yeah, a double star basically. Um, we only we only used 
one either one of the sides. So it was either the blue side or the red side was active at, at one time. And the other one served as a backup, basically. And if something was going wrong on one of the sides, you could swap over to the other one, right? Um, we're using Foundry's um, VSRP to, to at least on the lower edge block, uh, block the port that was not being active um, to avoid loops, right? VSRP virtual switch redundancy protocol, Foundry's, and they're now called Brocade, right? Um, and on the upper edge, um, so what we actually what we actually have here, I have to move over there. That's not going to work, what, right, with the microphone. <laughs> We've got a handheld mic if you want. Yeah. I actually like that. <laughs> I won't be on the webcast. Oh, that's all right. Do you mind? Yeah. That's they won't be able to hear. They won't be able to. See. They won't be able to see me, which is probably a good idea today. So <laughs> I'll just move over here now. <laughs> all right. Where was I? Two topologies. Right, VSRP on the side, build in, build in brocade, well, foundry brocade, whatever um, thing. You configure it, and it basically it sends it sends uh, packets along the way, um, as, uh, kind of hello sort of packets back and forth, and it decides based on that uh, which one of the which one of the core switches is supposed to be the master and which one is supposed to be the backup switch, and it basically blocks the ports that are not supposed to 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 be active at that certain time. Um, the problem is with the setup we have on the upper side, um, where we basically have every single switch. So we connect the customers on the very top to uh, to a layer one switch, a glimmer glass thingy. Does anyone not know, or does anyone know what a glimmer glass thing is? Okay, no one knows what it um, So it's this box where basically you plug in a lot of fibers and it has little mirrors inside and in a, in a vacuum or something. And those little mirrors, you can, you can map them to each other sort of the, the ports. So you basically, the light goes through the mirror and comes back out on the different port. So you have like a device with 64 ports you can plug in and you can mirror the light from each single one of those ports to each other one as you like. So we use that in a fashion where we connect the customer with his fiber to one of those glimmer glass ports. And then depending on, and those two switches here um, replace each other. And depending on whether we want the customer to be on this side or on that side, we just tell the little mirror to put it out on this port or put it out on that port, which connects to the actual blade in, in the switch, right? Makes sense? Thank you. <laughs> Interactive here, you know. <laughs> All right, little mirrors. So the, the the problem is the problem is since we have only one active side, um, you you have to you have to decide whether all the customers on this switch are going to be on this side or on the other side, right? So they have to be either on the blue or on the red side. You can't really do anything about distributing them or doing anything else. Okay, so this is pretty much how it looked like last year. Uh, I think this is kind of a summary of what I've just said. Does it, did I mention everything? Yeah, glimmer glass switches. Uh, to those we only connected the 10 giggy customers to and the, the edge switches on the lower side where um, we connected lower than 10 giggy customers. Um, okay, there's problems with this. The problems are, um, let me start from the bottom. Um, the problems are that where we, if, if we do a failover, we have to fail over this entire platform from blue to red. Um, it, it has an impact. There is a, there is a, there's a link flap for the customer. Those glimmer glass switches fail over in like 20 milliseconds or something like that. So mostly your BGP sessions are able to survive over this, but sometimes they don't. And sometimes if there's like long lines and layer two providers involved in between to actually get to the exchange, it kind of, you know, other equipment propagates, link, for, link, link flaps, crap, and it takes forever until it actually reaches your end somewhere, um, where then your BGP thinks, oh no, I'm timing out because I don't want this anymore. Um, so, so, the more demand you have for, for 10 gig ports, which is the case because technically a lot of people just buy 10 gig ports now and everything else we have is like, yeah, we still have it because it's, yeah, legacy product and still available, but, 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 but the, the biggest 
um, count on ports that we have uh, on the exchange is, is 10 gig ports that customers buy. Um, the more of those you have, um, the more impact you, you you have from from such a from such a failover, because you have you have more ports, more of them have to have to be swapped, and you just can't do anything. But we didn't do it really often. It happened like once a month, maybe or something like that. But still, it was a it was a not nice situation where basically. We also did it in cases where like line card breaks on that one side and two, three members on that line card are affected. We have to swap this entire topology over to replace that one line card that is broken, um, which was always a little weird situation because because of this one thing you have to like do this really big thing where 350 of your members scream and send you an email and go like, oh my God, it's not working. So this is one issue. The other issue is... Um, well, the other issue is all related to port density, because the more the more 10 gig ports we actually have, the more traffic it brings with it. The higher your your your, your backbone links to the core have to be in your in your start topology, as we saw earlier. So we, we we get to a situation where where we basically use if we use more than um, a third of the available ports we have on one switch just to connect to the backbone. We are, we are running out of ports very, very quickly. And by adding more and more separate switches to it, you, you again fill up your, your backbone ports more because um, the, the, more, the more members you have stuck together on, on the same switch, the more lo local switching you have, right? So you basically you want to have a big, the biggest box as possible so all the people are on one side and whatever they exchange locally can stay locally and then you can save on your, on your traffic, on your, on your backbone links. <coughs> this was all at least last year there was no talk about about having bigger switches the the biggest one we have is an MLX um, 32 which is 128 uh, 10 gig ports and last year when we started running into all those problems there was just no timeline or no, nothing in yeah coming up that we were like okay well, if we wait a couple of months we will be able to exchange it for something bigger and then everything will be fine again now um, so we had to rethink this entire concept and do something with our topology, and now it looks like this. <laughs> I think I think it's uh, I think it's very cool. It's like ah, oh. okay. <laughs> I'll explain. I'll explain. Don't worry. <coughs> so I said we now have MPLS, right? So what we wanted to do is basically add add. Actually, I want to go back here. It's going to be better. Um, what we actually wanted to do is add core switches in parallel, so um, so we have more more ports available to to connect all the edges to, right? Make sense? Make sense. The thing is, if in a layer two platform you can't just add switches in parallel, it's not gonna work, right? It's not. It, no, you can't if you if you if you connect this switch to here and that switch to there, they're not going to be able to talk to each other, right? And you can't connect this switch to both of them because then it's going to be even more fun. So, <coughs> so, so there's issues. Um, things like, like Trill is something that people talk about for years already. Um, Trill being a layer two and a half routing for switching sort of thing. Uh, but that's been talked about, not really done anything about yet so far. I think it's kind of coming there. Mike knows that. Mike has been passed or something like that in ITF, will be he there eventually. But everything, yeah, not at that time when we actually needed it, which was beginning of last year. Um, so we decided to go for MPLS because with MPLS we could we could add um, add those core core switches and 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 build path uh, the different paths from the edge switches one to another over those different core switches uh, and MPLS is load balancing that traffic now over those different cores we have. So what we do is we have four cores. Um, Obviously, because we want to have backups for everything, right? So you always need twice the capacity that you would actually want to want to use. So if we if if um, half of our cores fail, we still want to be able to switch everything we're actually supposed to switch. So we'd have double the capacity of everything, and two cores because we were running out of uh, space on one of those cores, right? So we 
upgraded, and then we need a double of that to, to retain our resilience. Um, so from every edge switch to every other edge switch, we now have um, four LSPs set up over every single one of those cores. Um, so every pair of edge switches, wait, I'll get to that, I think, I'll get to that, yeah. Start at the bottom. So on, on layer one, it's a full mesh of cables, basically every single switch connecting to every one of those cores. This is just this is a cable. Right? Okay. On top of that, on top of that, um, uh, every as I yeah as I just said, every 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 pair every pair of, of edge switches um, has has LSPs over every single one of those. And then the path, the path going over those LSPs have basically are um, every path going over every over every of those cores has a backup on the other core. So if what I just said, if half of our if half of our core switches dies, um, it just it would just use the secondary path going over the first two core switches, uh, not doing anything bad. You just need to. The only thing you need to watch out for and things like that is that you have enough capacity all the time to provide for that. But we're monitoring and seeing and everything good. Um, yeah, another thing is that now uh, we are able, which is actually really cool now, we are able to now distribute customers over those two switches that were early, earlier they were redundant, right? And members had to be either on one side or on the other side. Now, where everything is one big active platform and we don't have a we don't have a passive backup anymore, um, we're able to distribute uh, the traffic over those edge switches as we sort of like and want to have it distributed. Um, but also, when one of those when one of those edge switches fails, um, all um, same same situation as before. Kind of the the photonic glimmer glass thingy moves its little mirror and switches over all customers to to the other side. Uh, we did some fancy scripting for that. We have a, we have a software running that is actually um, listening to listening to our switches, listening to our platform, listening to traps on LSPs going down, coming up and things like that and reacting on all this. So we have like everything automated out. We have all our, because if you actually have this amount of switches and want to configure this amount of path and stuff and everything on it, you really want to automate that. It's, it's not going to be fun to type at all. So this is a couple of things that we basically pre pre prepared for this summer, uh, last summer, um, writing all those scripts to be able to, uh, to manage all this later on. Um, some other facts. Okay, this was, this was the part on the topology. Any questions on this so far? Uh, yes. Excuse me. I don't really hear you. Well done. Um, so the question for me that's, that's interesting is how you're, how you're modeling the network to make sure that all the paths have got enough bandwidth to carry all the traffic. We look at it. We have we have a couple of we have a couple of scripts that basically monitor uh, monitor our graphs, our graphing, and whenever whenever we run over 50% capacity on certain links or something like that, it just sends us email and says, "Woo, you want to think about this?" And then we are actually in the process, and I haven't had time to do that yet. In the process of um, doing some fancy scripting where we could actually, well. What we, what we could do is when we want to distribute customers over those two switches we have at the top that are, replace each other, right? We could figure out a sort of semi-optimal way to distribute them that they have the highest amount on local switching possible, right? But yeah, that's something on a to-do list for sometime. So we, 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 do, we do things like that. We basically, we sit there, we script a lot, we, we, we figure out a lot of ways on, on, on how can we automate this out and how can we get Modeling, no. no, no. We have we we get numbers. We scripted. <coughs> All right. Uh, a couple of a couple of other facts. What's going to happen now? So um, there will be there will be higher density blades at some point. So we are going to have switches that are going to have more than one hundred and twenty-eight uh, ports. 
uh, unfortunately, it seems like all of those uh, higher density blades will be based on SFP+. Plus. And we're using the WDM in, in, in our backbone network to co connect all those loca locations to the core, um, which is not going to be going to be available as SFP+, plus, at least not anytime soon. Um, so we are this summer switching uh, to active DWDM equipment um, based on an MRV boxes and installing that all over our platform to, to be able to eventually upgrade and exchange everything for yeah, more, more ports on plates. Uh, route servers, yeah. I, Andy talked about this last time here, I believe, right? So I don't have to say much about that. But we have two route servers. They're sort of semi-stable. We tested them and we had a lot of fun doing that, if you saw Andy's presentation. So. <laughs> All right. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? We covered them already, right? So probably badly, badly over time as well. Sorry. Well done, Thanks very much, Elisa.